Well, again, good morning. I want to invite you, if you have a Bible with you, to turn with me to Ephesians 5. And if you don't have one, that's totally fine. The passage will be on the screen, and it's also there uh, in your notes as well. Uh, Ephesians 5. And as you're turning there, I uh, kind of recap the whole series. As you just saw, the, the title of this series is Love Is, and it really is us looking at what love looks like according to the book of Ephesians. And I've said before multiple times that if you were to take the book and split it into two, chapters 1 through 3 deal with who we are in Christ. It's, it's where Paul says there in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And then the back half of that book, this where we are now, chapters 4, 5, and 6, have to deal with what are those good works. Uh, and I'm going to pause here for a second. Do you want to turn the fog machine off? It's all good. I feel like I'm at a concert or something. Anyway, so uh, as you're turning there, awesome. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate that. I know you like it. <sighs> anyway, uh, so as you're turning there, as you're looking there, I, I want to take you back to when I was a teenager. So my family, for a half of my life, we farmed. And so during the summer times and uh, often in the uh, fall, I would be on a tractor. And uh, they never let me do any of the important stuff like planning anything. Uh, they usually just gave me the disc and said, get out there, boy, tear it all up. It's all good. You can't mess that up. So I would drive the disc. And on our tractors, we typically uh, had a radio, and it would pretty much play only country music. Matter of fact, I think the tractors that were, uh, that were created or built in the 90s, I don't think they got any other station but country stations. So I grew up listening to Alan Jackson and, and uh, Tim McGraw and uh, some of those other kind of 90s, two, early 2000 uh, country singers. Some of them are still around today. And I remember there was a song that Tim McGraw came out with about the time I was 16, 17 years old. And the song was called, Live Like You're Dying. And I remember listening to that song and, and hearing it for the first time and thinking, even as a teenager, wow. Like, that's a powerful truth, the idea that, that you and I are, are going to die, and so to live like we're dying. You know, the, the chorus goes on to say, you know, what, what there's, a, well, excuse me, there's a line in that song that says this. It says, live like you were dying. Like tomorrow is a gift, and you have eternity to think about what did you do with it. And then he goes on to, you know, declare what he would do with his life. Skydiving, I went. Now, now it's going to be in your head all day long. I just messed with you. We're Rocky Mountain climbing and, and 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And he lays out all these things he would do if if. The day, that day was his last day. And many of you, if not all of you, have at least heard that song, Live Like You're Dying. And that's a pretty powerful concept, a really interesting idea. And I think that maybe Tim McGraw consulted Scripture, probably not. But all throughout God's Word, we see that same truth over and over in, the, in Proverbs and Psalm and Ecclesiastes, and then here now in this passage as well, this idea that we are to live like we are dying, like this, is, this day is a gift from God and it impacts eternity. And so if you're here this morning and you genuinely desire to live like you are dying, to, to make an impact, because I can assure you that riding two point seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu or climbing the Rocky Mountains, or jumping out of an airplane, while all those things are fun and great for certain personality types, maybe not for all, that is not the apex of God's creation. That is not why He has put you on this planet. And so this morning we're going to see three very simple ways that you and I can live like we are dying, and when we do die, the, the embrace of the Father saying, well done, will be our reward if we take these three truths to heart and we live them out in our lives, how we can live like we're dying. I want to pray for us uh, after I read this text, and then we will dive into these three powerful truths. Let's begin in verse 15 of chapter 5 there in the book of Ephesians. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. 
So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. In verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's pray this morning as we dive into three significant and simple ways that you and I can live like we're dying in the eyes of God. Let's pray. Father, I confess to you now in this moment and before your people that I am absolutely powerless apart from you. That my words are simply that, words. Unless your spirit and your word and your power and your truth are declared. And so, Father, I pray right now that you would do immeasurably more in this moment. That, Father, you would open our eyes, open our ears. God, some of us here, man, we're living this passage out, and some of us may not be living it, it, like we are dying, like this passage lays out. And so, Father, help us by your power and grace and care. Help us to live out and embody this passage of Scripture. And, God, help me to explain it so simply and so thoroughly and so clearly. I can only do that with your help, Lord. I pray that right now you would do immeasurably more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Three ways that we can live like we are dying. And the first one is this. We can make the most of our time. Make the most of your time. Literally, Paul has been talking about what love looks like, how we can be God's people. And he starts off by saying, therefore, be careful or pay attention to how you walk. Now we said last week, and if you weren't here, maybe you're new, there's an idea here. When Scripture talks about us walking, it doesn't necessarily mean how we are physically walking. It means how we are spiritually walking. It's another way to say pay attention to how you're living. You know, when you walk, you, you place one foot in front of the other. And what Paul's saying is pay attention to where you are placing the steps of your life. Because every step you take will ultimately determine the course that you're going. I'm going to say that again. Every step that you take will determine the course that you're going. Every decision, that's why Paul says to be careful to think about how you're walking. Because every decision you make is a step. And every step that you take will ultimately determine the course of your life. And so he says pay attention how you're walking. And he goes on to define it. Not as unwise men, but as wise so wisdom is a motivation here for how we should live. Making the most of your time, I love this, because the days are evil. He's literally saying, pay attention to how you're living. Make the most of the time you got because none of us know how many seconds we have left. I used to tell our college students, there is a clock over your head in the eyes of God that you cannot see, that I cannot see, but he sees. And that clock is not going up, that clock is going down. Every one of us has a day that has been allotted in eternity past for us to breathe our last. And so he says, make the most of the seconds of the breaths that you have in your life. Are you doing that? That if today was your last day, could you look back and say, yep, I did it. In the eyes of God, I did what he has called me to do. Making the most of your time. And he gives a reason why we should do this. Because the days are evil. I want to make two points about that. Let me share something with you. First off, Paul did not write this in 2020. Didn't write it in 2020, didn't write it in 2021. So that helps us to believe one thing, that the days were evil, the days are evil, and the days are going to continue to be evil. That this world is broken. From the moment of Genesis 3 on, everything in creation, including you and I, is broken beyond repair unless Christ repairs it. These days that he was talking about were evil. There is no good old days that we need to get back to because even in the good old days, they were evil. When Paul was writing this letter, he was also having to write a letter to the church at Corinth and tell them, hey guys, when you have the Lord's Supper, don't get hammered because they were getting hammered as they were having the Lord's Supper. 
There is some messed up things that were happening now, and there are messed up things that are happening now. The days are evil, and they always have been evil. But secondly, I want you to understand this on a more personal note. This is kind of global note, okay? So all this world is messed up. It's broken. The governments, they're messed up. Everything messed up, broken, busted. No good old days we need to get back to because there's never been. But also I want to bring this to you personally. He says here, hey, make the most of your time because the days are evil. The second truth is that, listen, you and I are bent towards running from God. We are naturally inclined to drift away from godliness and not to it. Listen, you wake up every morning and you don't spend time in his word. You don't give one prayer to him. You just go about your day, do your life. Let me share something with you. Then you disconnect from the church or you haven't been a part of the church that long. Listen, you and I naturally, I, myself included, we naturally drift away from God. That is who we are. That's what we do as human beings. And a lot of us are like, oh, I got this. I can do this on my own. I can handle this. I don't need to read scripture. That's just for really spiritual people. I got this. Well, let me share something with you. You and I naturally drift away from God. That's what he means by here. The days are evil. Your days are evil. If you don't consciously think about how you're walking, how you're living, and if you're making the most of your time, you and I, myself included, will drift away from God. We do not drift towards God. We do not drift towards missions. We do not drift towards holiness. We do not not drift towards sharing the gospel. We do not drift towards loving people. We do not drift towards forgiving people. It is not in us to drift towards those things, but to drift away from them. And so Paul's helping them understand, hey, make the most of your days, because if you don't, you're going to drift away from God. You're going to drift away from holiness. You're going to drift away from His will. And let me show you a really powerful way for you and I to make the most of our time. Pay attention to how we're using this. And let me show you something unbelievably incredible that for some of you will blow your mind. You ready for this? I don't even think some of you know that this thing will do this. You ready? Watch this. You touch this. It's on right now. You touch this little side button right here. (gasps) Slide to power off. Ah! It's off! It's done. You know what's interesting is oftentimes when you and I get on this, have you ever thought about your posture? Just a few weeks ago I thought about this. I was looking at something, text messages, then I got on Instagram, then I got on searching for stuff. I'm always researching outdoor stuff or whatever. You know what I realized about my posture? I'm bowing. You ever thought about that? Even when you're sitting down, you're bowing. Has anyone ever thought about the fact that there is a piece of fruit with a bite out of it on the back of most of these? What story does that remind you of? Now, I'm not saying they're whatever, but it is ironic. And if we're not careful, we're going to spend our whole lives on this little box. Did you know that if you spent four hours a day, just four hours, and by the way, you can look it up now, how much you spend on this thing. Four hours a day on average, which is a pretty normal day. If you spend four hours a day, And you multiply that into the year. Do you know how many days in that year you spent on your phone? 56 full days on your phone. One-sixth of your life looking and scrolling and typing and searching. If Paul was writing this to us today, he would add that caveat. Make the most of the time you've got with this little box that you hold. Make the most of your time. I have made a commitment that I want my children to know my face and not the top of my head. And I think that a lot of you parents potentially in the room are missing the most of your time. Because you are more concerned about what's happening in everybody else's world but your own, in your own house. Do you not think that all that time you spend there, they don't see that? That it doesn't impact them, that they don't start to filter and believe that my parents care more about what's happening there than what's happening with me. We are shaping a generation to want this more than relationships. Because they're going to grow up thinking, my parents want to look at this more than they want to look at me. So therefore, that must be more important than what is happening around me. Make the most of your time. Let me share with you what my son said the other day. I was putting him down and 
for bed. And we had just seen something on TV that mentioned death. He's five. And so he's starting to understand what death is. And, and it means that you're not here anymore. And he still doesn't quite understand all of it. But I was sitting there and, and I was talking to him. And he just erupted in tears. And I said, buddy, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, daddy, are you going to die? And I kind of paused. And I looked at him and I said, well, yeah, bud. One day, dad, dad is going to die. Hopefully a long, long time from now. And then he said this to me. He said, daddy, I don't want you to die. I just want to be with you all the time. And I started crying. He doesn't quite understand life yet. And that's when it hit me. I was studying for this passage of Scripture. And that's when it hit me. I can't change the government. <laughs> I can't change what's happening up there. I can't change what's happening in our world. I can pray, obviously, and that's the greatest power we have. But I, I can't change it. And I can, I can say things and post things and do whatever. But I, I, I can't change much. I'm going to tell you something. That's when it hit me right there. I can change his world. I can impact his world. Because what's happening here is not as important as what was happening in that bedroom, in that moment with my little boy. And let me share something with you. You and I can't change a whole lot. But we can, by the grace of God, Make the most of the time that we have with the people in our lives, the people who don't know Jesus, the people in our families. And we get so caught up in the things that we can't control that we forget about the things that we can. Make the most of your time. You want to live like you were dying? Make the most of your time. Secondly, we need to understand the will of the Lord. We need to understand the will of the Lord. One verse, verse 17. He says, So then, do not be foolish. But understand what the will of the Lord is. I, I like that first word, understand. It means put thought to. Think about this. What God's will is for your life, for the church's life. Seek the will of God. Let me tell you something about God's will. For your life specifically. That God's will to a large majority, is broken up into two major sections. And what I call God's spelled out will and God's specific will. God's spelled out will and God's specific will. Here's what I mean by God's spelled out will. It is what is happening right here. 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is God's will for your life, your sanctification, that you abstain from all forms of sexual immorality. God's will from Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. God's will. Do not be anxious, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ. God's spelled out will is right here. And we spend so much of our lives ignorant and devoid of God's will that he says here because we're so fascinated with God's specific will. Who am I going to marry? Where am I going to live? God, do this. God, do that. God, help me here. God, help me there. And we neglect God's specific will so that we can get God's spelled out will. Excuse me. God's spelled out will for God's specific will. Let me share something with you. It's really difficult to get God's specific will for your life when you do not care or are not living for God's spelled out will. Young ladies in the room. It is going to be really difficult for you to find the guy that God has for you when you are giving small pieces of your heart and your body to every and any single guy that comes along. God has a spelled out will for you, but it's going to be really hard to find that specific guy when that's happening. Gentlemen, young men, it is going to be really difficult 
for you to find the woman of God that he has designed perfectly for you. When you are looking at a computer screen or this right here at an image of an actress that is displaying to you what women actually are and what they want to do for you. It will be really difficult for you to find that woman when all you are viewing is what these women are telling you and doing for you, which is a lie, a falsehood. So if you want God's specific will, it comes as you and I live day to day faithfully obeying his spelled out will. Understand what the will of the Lord is. So that you can live like you are dying. I mean, just make that, just think about that. It's really hard to live like you are dying if you have no idea how God wants you to live. I'm gonna say that again. It's really hard to live like you are dying if you have no idea what, how God wants you to live. And all of us are so caught up in the specific will of God that we have forgotten the spelled out will. And listen, I want to make another point about this just in regards to God's will. The American church is so caught up with and fascinated by and just pursuing relentlessly all of these things that are supposed to happen and taking place and these Bible prophecies and all these things. And let me share something with you. If God wanted you and I to understand everything that's going to happen in this world, specific will, he would have told us. But let me give you a word of prophecy from Jesus' mouth himself in the book of Revelation at the very last chapter, the very last thing he says. He says, and behold, I am coming quickly. That word means promptly. Bam, he's coming and you won't have any, any notice of it. And so all this stuff, like, oh, we're going to figure all these things out. And what does that government mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? Listen, Jesus has already told us, be ready. I win. Be ready. I win. Be ready. I win. Understand God's will so that you can live it. It's it's, It's... it's a sad reality in the, in the Bible Belt especially. And I say this with so much love, with a calling on my life to the Bible Belt. I just read recently that the Bible Belt is one of the most difficult places on the planet to do ministry because everybody thinks they're a Christian, but nobody wants to follow Christ. Everybody thinks they're good because they vote a certain way or they act a certain way or we respect mama and and I'm going to heaven because of that. And and it's so mind-blowing how many people think they are going to heaven that care nothing about the will of heaven. Understand what the will of the Lord is. To live like we're dying, we have to make the most of the time we've got. We don't live forever. Seconds are winding down on our life. Secondly, to live like we're dying, we've got to understand what God's will is. If you don't know, ask him. If you don't know, open it up. And then lastly, if we want to live like we're dying, we must be filled with the Spirit. We must be filled with the Spirit. This may hurt a little. And I I am declaring this in love and grace and truth with, again, the calling on my life to be here with you this morning. But this may hurt a little. Verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with with the Spirit. I want to pause right there and make this unbelievably clear. Drunkenness is sin. Drunkenness is sin. And I want you to understand how grievous God sees it. Because in this passage of Scripture, He literally equates drunkenness And contrast that with being filled with the Spirit. 
Because I want you to think about this. What we're going to see after this truth is what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. Not only today, but the next couple of weeks. And so what you and I need to understand is he's literally contrasting being filled with alcohol and being filled with the Spirit. Because when you are filled with the Spirit, you do things that are not natural to you. Which we're going to see here in just a moment. Loving, being kind, forgiving, graceful, joyful. But when you and I are filled with alcohol, we do things that we would not naturally do. The same way we do with the Spirit except they are all fleshly. They are of the flesh. That word dissipation, it's the same word we get debauchery from. And I don't know what that word meant. I actually didn't know what both of those words meant. But what Paul's saying is, when you're drunk with wine, when you're drunk with alcohol, debauchery, which is as defined by Scripture, reckless and careless living. Reckless, bad decisions, and careless, I don't care. And he's saying, listen, you can be filled with drunkenness and make reckless and careless decisions or be filled with the Spirit. He contrasts the two. Makes them in opposition to each other. Not me, not the Southern Baptist Convention, Scripture. You know, there's a reason why they call it wines and spirits. Ever thought about that? Because when you and I drink alcohol, we start doing things that we wouldn't normally do. Loosens us up, kind of unleashes what's going on on the inside. But the opposite of that is when we're filled with the Spirit, God starts loosening the things of heaven in our life. So this is what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. The result of being filled with wine is debauchery, careless and recklessness. This is what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. This is the results, the, the, the byproduct of being filled with the Spirit. Here they are. First, he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I love this idea, and I have never caught it before that he says speaking, and then he goes on to say songs and hymns and spiritual songs. That doesn't make sense. Like, these things you sing, you don't speak. But what Paul is helping us to understand is that when we are filled with the Spirit, and only when we are filled with the Spirit, will the words of our mouth be like melodies in the ears of other people. Listen, when we sing praises to God, it sounds good to heaven and here. And the same thing is true about when we're filled with the Spirit, that when we speak to our spouses, when we speak to our children, when we speak to our neighbors or our co-workers, who don't look like us, act like us, vote like us, or think like us. The words out of our mouth are not brokenness, anger, hate. The words out of our mouth are soothing and kind like the most beautiful song from heaven you've ever heard. That's what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. Evidence number one. Evidence number two of being filled with the Spirit. He says there, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, I told you this is going to hurt. The second evidence that someone is truly filled with the Spirit of God is that when praises are being sung, they are singing. I cannot tell you how... Let me rephrase this. When we sit here, here in this, and then the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday... And Sundays until Jesus comes back or you go home. If you sit here with no words coming out of your mouth, every week it happens. Just sitting here, hands crossed, looking around, looking at the screen. It is immediately evident that you are not filled with the Spirit. Because literally, Paul says, the result of being filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God who has saved you, redeemed you, made you new. The result of being filled with His Spirit is that you sing, that there is melodies coming out, especially when you're singing about the blood of Christ that was shed on your behalf, when you're singing about the sovereignty of God that over is over all of these things, when you're singing about the glories of heaven and the kindness of God and the mercy of God, and there is no words coming out of your mouth. It is a dead set rule from Scripture itself that you are not filled with the Spirit. doesn't mean you're not saved, but it means you walked in here spiritless. 
Singing is a result of being filled with the Spirit. And it doesn't matter if you don't sound good or not. And all the tone deaf people in the room said, praise God. Or praise God, you know, whatever. Psalms tells us, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And a result of being filled with the Spirit is that your mouths move when praises are sung. You know, it's funny, I, I said that at 9.30 and... I was up here at front doing the invitation, and when I looked out across the crowd, everybody singing, singing. Like, I ain't going to be looking like I ain't filled with the Spirit. No, sir. I'm going to be singing. Y'all would too. During the invitation, you know what you're singing. He's like, ah, blah, blah, blah. singing. <laughs> but listen, there's a reason why Trey and this band gets up here and leads us. Because we're so caught up with what heaven's going to be like. Let me show you the, the thing that blew John's mind away about heaven Everybody's singing. What we're doing here is like a microcosm. It is an appetizer to what heaven is going to be like. And when we are in heaven, filled with the Spirit of God, we will constantly be erupting and singing and praising to God. So, here on the earth now, when no lips are moving, arms crossed, you are literally declaring to this church, I'm here. But I am not filled with the Spirit. And the second part of that is that he says, making melody with your heart. I love this. The artists in the room should really connect to this. He's not just saying just sing words and then you're filled with the Spirit. No, he's saying it's got to connect to your heart. Let me tell you one thing that I do every song that we sing. I learned this from another preacher. Is when we sing songs, your mind kind of goes at different places. And you start thinking about different stuff that's going on. You see your kids. You're like, oh, stop doing that. But what I've made a practice of doing is a line in scripture, or excuse me, finding a line in one of those songs and just really capturing it and really taking it to heart, really thinking about that. That this morning it was your love always satisfies. Your love always satisfies as we sang that this morning. And I just was sitting on that and my heart was being filled with joy as I sang, but also as I thought about in my heart what that truth means that we're singing. Listen, worship is both singing and agreeing. I'll say that again. Worship is both singing and agreeing in your heart. The second evidence that someone is truly filled with the Spirit is number one, their kind words, number two, that they're singing. With their hearts and their mouths. Number three, he tells us that they are always, verse 20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God. That is impossible apart from the Spirit of God. Every single person in this room, all of us, every single one has at least one thing in our lives that are causing such grief and pain and hurt and brokenness, anger, fear, you turn on the TV for five minutes and you get enough of it to, to, to feed you for the whole week. How can we give thanks to God when the world around us and our personal world is completely falling apart? Once well, you've got to be filled with the Spirit. Listen, Christians have a bad habit of making life a line graph. All right, here's, a, here's what I mean by that. Agent Rogers laid this out so well. Pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He said, a lot of times we Christians, we look at life like a line graph. Oh, everything's going good. I'm so excited. Oh, it's going bad. Oh, that happened. Oh, oh, it's going good. Everything got the job. Oh, it's going great. Oh, that's going. Oh, it's just back and forth, a line graph, up and down, up and down. And so we constantly live our lives terrified that the line's going to go down. Oh, what's going to happen today? What's going to take place? And Dr. Rogers said, that is the most unbiblical way to view life. He said, the way that we need to view life is like a a set of train tracks. You've all seen a pair of train tracks. Got two of them. One side, he says, represents the blessings of God, the good things that are happening in your life, that you had food and water in a home and clothing that you are wearing, loved ones around you, a job where you can provide, all these things. These are the blessings of God. And on the other side of the tracks are the burdens, the hurts, the things that don't make sense. The things that you just can't chapter and verse that are going on in your life. The deaths of people in your life. The loss of job. The fear of the future. All those things. And he said life runs on two tracks always. There will always be burdens and there will always be blessings. 
That is the biblical way to view life. So here's the deal. If a train goes on one side of the tracks, it won't do that for very long. If you and I start thinking that everything in life is awful and all the days are evil and nothing is going to be good and nothing is great and I just have nothing to rejoice in and you start sliding over this way, well, that train will topple. That's bad theology. That's not true. But if you get over here on this side, oh, everything's great and because I'm pursuing God, everything should be good for me and because me and my family are going to church that everything should go well and things should be comfortable and blessings and all these great things and I shouldn't lose my job and all these things. Well, if you believe that, you're also going to topple. That's bad theology. How can we give thanks in all things? We're filled with the Spirit every day. And we realize that every day has its burdens and has its blessings. Every single day. But there will come a day where those train tracks are gone. And we'll be it. Before the face of the one who was driving the engine. Speaking to one another in kindness, the result of the Spirit, singing to the Lord, always giving thanks. And then lastly, and I'm going to invite the band back up as we bring all this together this morning. What is the result of being filled with the Spirit? It's being subject or submissive to one another. Look what he says, that last verse. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to go ahead and give you a precursor to next week, okay? So if you go ahead and read your Bible, or if you just know what Ephesians 5.22 is, it's the infamous verse where wives are called to be submissive or to be subject to their husbands. Ugh, I felt it. Arrow. Shot. It's a controversial passage. You know, it's, it's real touch and go. But you need to understand something. The word that he uses right here, be subject to one another, is the same word he uses in, same Greek word that he uses in verse 22. And so we need to understand something about what Paul's saying here. He's saying that when someone is filled with the Spirit, they are submissive to other people. What that means is they serve other people. They respect the people around them. Literally, he's saying here that if you are filled with the Spirit, Paul says later in the book of Ephesians, that you count others as more important than yourself. That is so opposite of the American lifestyle. You do you. You focus on you. You're the most important. Every need, everybody needs to hear you. And God is telling us that is the complete opposite of being filled with the Spirit. That being filled with the Spirit means that you care more about other people that you are subject to and are servants of other people. And he makes this caveat that we don't need to miss. In the fear of Christ. In the fear of Christ. What does that mean? That word fear is the same idea of reverence. A holy reverence for Jesus. How, how, how does holy reverence have to do with being subject to one another? Well, let me help us understand this this morning. That we serve a Christ, a God, who did, not, who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, a slave. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The most humiliating, criminally, op, 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 in opposition, criminally, death he could have received. That he's literally saying, if you claim to know Christ, how in the world can you claim that you have rights and privileges, that you are better than other people? That, because Christ did the complete opposite of that. That you and I are to live in such a way that we serve and care for each other out of reverence for the one who served and cared for us. How audacious it is for us to think for one moment that we are better than somebody else because we have more money or because we or because we are whatever, fill in the blank. We vote this way or act this way or we're this color or that color. What God is saying here is we are submissive to each other, caring for, considering each other more important than ourselves because that's what Jesus did for us. There is so much of the American culture that is in complete opposition to what Christ is calling us as the church. And our calling is to be submissive to each other out of fear and reverence for the one who came for us. Amen. 
So we are all dying. I heard someone say one time, everybody dies, but only a few people live. Everybody dies, but only a few people live. And if you want to live like you're dying, if you want to live life to the fullest, you've got to make the most of your time by the help of God. You've got to understand the will of God with the help of God. And you've got to be filled with the Spirit by the help of God. So how are you walking? Are you living like you're dying? Listen, some of you are here this morning, and you need to understand something. You're dying. But heaven will not be your home. That on your last day, whether it's five minutes from now or 50 years from now, if today was your last day, you would not be greeted by Christ, but sentenced by Him. But you need to understand something. He loves you. He loves you so much that He chose a, a cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again and now he's extending his hand while the gate is still open from heaven and declaring, I will save you. I will forgive you and I will make you mine for all eternity. You just need to call out to him and ask him to save you. Like, how do I do that, Blake? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Here's what you say. There's no magic formula. There's no special words. You call out to Christ in prayer and you say, God, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. And I deserve hell. But I believe that you love me. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to die for me. And I believe you resurrected from the grave. And now I repent of my sins. I put my faith in you and what you've done for me. Save me. Make me yours. And when you pray that in faith and sincerity, and in Jesus' name, he will save you. Some of you are here, though, and you're saved. You're just not living like you're dying. So this morning, I want this to serve from the very truth of God as a wake-up call for you. To make the most of your time. To really dig in and figure out what is God's will for my life. And to be filled with the Spirit. You may be like, well, Blake, how do I be filled with the Spirit? You ask Him. Holy Spirit, fill me and use me for your glory every day. When your feet hit the ground, all of hell should shudder. Oh, no, they're up. That only happens when somebody's filled with the Spirit. I'm going to pray over you this morning. You sing, you pray, you get right with Jesus this morning. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would do immeasurably more now in this moment. Save people who need to be saved. Wake your church up. Help us to live like we're dying. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.